you know, typically uh, what will happen is John Gilstrap will be co-hosting. Now, John was a guest once on this program when he moved to the area. I think his publicist reached out and contacted me about having him on the program. Uh, New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap is uh, out with a new book, and he now resides close to where you're located. Would you be interested in having him on the show? And, of course, I jumped at the chance because for years I had been wanting to meet John Gilstrap, and when it finally became an opportunity to do so, how could I say no? So we brought John into the studio. He was so good that uh, I threw the olive branch out there about maybe considering being a co-host at some point along the way. He took us up on that, and he's been doing that so well that he'll be actually guest hosting for me uh, the uh, July uh, 9 week when, when I'm gone. And now he returns to guest role. Calling in this morning, I guess from Texas still. John, good morning to you. Good morning. <clears throat> Actually, this is the first time I've used my vocal cords today. I'm I'm kind of happy they engaged. <laughs> yeah, are you are you in Texas still or no, or what? I am in Texas. I am in um, where am I? I'm in Alpine, Texas. <laughs> Alpine, Texas. Where is that in the state? Um, yeah. If if you consider it, the Texas kind of looks like a boot, I'm in the heel of the boot, about 80 miles from Mexico. Okay, sure. very good. What kind of temperatures are you living yeah. with right now, my man? Well, yesterday we had a cool 112, but according to the sign, it was it felt like 135. Hmm. <laughs> which, 135? Which is, yeah. That's what it said. But, I don't know. but I, the I, I humidity I is, had... is less, correct, oh, that John? Doesn't make I'm, kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm yeah, kidding. It's not the heat, it's the humidity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. It, hey, hey, no, it's the, it's the dry heat. John, like, a, like a blowtorch is a dry heat. John, were you in the big band the same time that father and son died of heat exhaustion? Mm. Um, actually, I don't know. I haven't. I haven't heard the news. That if it happened yesterday, then yes. no, no, it was happened about three days ago. Three. No, we okay. weren't there yet. Um, there are there are heat alerts and warnings everywhere around here, and uh, we didn't do a lot of walking around. Quite honestly, we would drive to a place and then kind of tour around. There's some really interesting stuff out there. Uh, there's a a town, it's actually a ghost town where people still live. It's called Trilingua, and it's an old mining community. And I don't know if you've ever saw Terminator 2, yes. where um, they're out in the desert and, the, and they're making weapons and stuff. It's kind of like that. It's People are living in tents. Um, the, one guy has built a house that looks like the fantail of a submarine, and, and he's living in it. Uh, it it's just... It's kind of an odd place. It's quirky. Um, but people still function. And I guess, you know, you get used to anything. Drink a lot of water. Yeah, but this the this is unusually hot for this time, for even Texas this time of year. It's a, it is. In fact, yeah. um, according to the my, the other couple we're traveling with, Revis Wortham, another author buddy of mine, um, Alpine is supposed to be the cool spot. So it normally is going to be in the 80s when everything else is is topping 100. It's just a weird heat dome, I guess, that's over the city, right over the state right now. I know you were in Fredericksburg a couple of weeks ago uh, going to the Nimitz Museum. Uh, I have a good friend who lives in Fredericksburg, and I was talking to him yesterday, and he said it was unusually hot for him, the hottest it's been there in the last 30 or 40 years during this time of year. Well, yeah. the last time I visited Texas, I, I broke their drought. I, I I brought flooding rains with me, so this time I'm bringing scorching drought, or scorching heat. Is the uh, is the land cracked, John? Is it that dry? It's not so much. If you ever been to the desert southwest, it's kind of that crumbly, not really sand, more like gravel. Yeah. Um, uh, so, not really cracked, but deep arroyos run through everything. You could see it wouldn't take much rain to turn this into. Uh, you know, raging rivers crossing the crossing the street. Yeah, and there are signs of that on on the highways. Actually, there's dust remaining on the roads where the royals have, have flooded fairly recently. I guess I that would think that stuff would blow away over time. It's a whole different world here. It's so, very it, interesting. That's why we're here. I'm kind of traveling around doing research, actually. For in the same year, you've been in Alaska, where it was minus what? With the wind chill? It was minus thirty five. And now, now you're. No, that, was not, that was not wind chill. That was, that was that the temperature. Was, yeah. And now you're in Texas where it feels like 135. Right. Yeah. That's, 
But going back to your point, Rob, about cracking, that's one of the real problems in Texas because so much of it's built, uh, the houses are built in with clay or in clay area. Mm -hmm. And if it dries out, there's been several foundations that have been lost because of the, the ground literally pulling away from the foundation. Goodness. John, you've got a writer's workshop coming up. I do, and I would like to plug it a little bit. On July 8th, uh, from 1 to 5 in the afternoon um, at Shepherdstown Public Library. I'm going to be conducting a writer's seminar that's called Adrenaline Rush, How to Write Suspense Fiction. Uh, this is a uh, co course that I developed originally for the Smithsonian, and I delivered it a couple of times there, and then I've done it probably a dozen times around the country at different writers' conferences and such. In fact, I'll be doing it again at Ball State University later this month. What it does, it's... It, it's kind of a different approach to teaching people how to write commercial fiction, um, suspense fiction. Normally, writing teachers break up, you know, the three elements of a story are character, plot, and setting. And that's just, a, I think, a mistaken way to think about it. So what we do through writing exercises and through lectures is show people how you can't have plot without character, you can't have character without setting or with plot. So it's really it's more of a not than it is three different uh, approaches uh, or three different elements. Uh, I've had a lot of success with it. It's free of charge, and uh, seating is limited, but all you have to do is call um, uh, the library at 901-229-1065. That's actually a cell phone number for Leanne um, Warner. And her uh, email address is Leanne, L-E-E-A-N-N, at sheplibrary.org. Uh, it should be a really great time. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's pretty dynamic. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to, to <clears throat> sort of speed write and to, <clears throat> excuse me, and to share, share your writing with the class and get input. Uh, it's a great time will be had by all, July 8th. <laughs> Well, go ahead, Maria. No, I was just going to ask. So, John, clearly you've done this before, um, and I'm I'm kind of fascinated. Not that I think I'm going to be a suspense writer, but you know, who knows? The world is is Could one's happen. oyster. So yeah. um, maybe maybe you'll see me there. But um, what's the uh, what draws people? Um, obviously, you're very well known, and you've had a lot of success. But what? draws people to a particular kind of workshop like this? Well, I think people who want to write know they want to write. Typically, they start by being voracious readers, mm -hmm. and they just kind of want to share, you know, put the thoughts in their head down on, on paper. And oftentimes, certainly at the beginning of everybody's uh, writing journey, if that's the right phrase, um, it's very frustrating because what you have in your head is not what you see reflected onto the page. And the, the way to get through that is to, to write it over and over again. For me, um, my own, as I was coming up in this, in my, you know, my first book was actually my fourth book. And um, it's kind of the same thing that compels you to read a book. You just kind of have to. You don't feel comfortable unless you're sitting in a corner and reading. You get these stories in your head. You don't feel comfortable unless you get them out of your head. That sounds psychotic, but <laughs> that's, that's, that's kind of how it works. I like the way you've analyzed your own head in regards to this whole writing process, John. Something tells me you've spent some time doing that. Oh, a little bit, perhaps. Um, I do think, you know, if for me, writing is a lot, I keep coming back to this, is a lot like reading. You know, you get into that in a really good book, however you define that. Um, there's a transference thing that happens where the reality of the book is more real than the reality of your chair. And that's the way it is when, when I write. You get into the zone, and, and the, the story just kind of flows. It's very therapeutic. I mean, it's, it's certainly an enjoyable way to do anything. Anytime you, know, anytime you get into that really serious concentration moment, um, whether it's writing or uh, I used to get there when I would do budgets when I had a big boy job, uh, just the, the concentration is so high, time goes by. And all of a sudden, it's three hours later. Uh, that's mm -hmm. that's what compels me. And if I don't do it, it just doesn't feel right. That's the same feeling I get sometimes when I get home from uh, doing the shift. I'll, I'll sit on my couch 
And the next thing I know, it's three hours later, and I'm drooling on a pillow. I, it just happens. You don't really understand why or how, but three hours goes by quickly. Hey, John, you made a comment a couple minutes ago about uh, having just uh, write-ins like reading, that you have thoughts that you just have to get rid of, you want to put down on paper. Do you go through a self-filtering process to say that this particular thought has merit or this particular thought is something I'd never want to put on paper? Or, or who do you bounce those things off of yeah, if you don't? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the first part is always after the fact. I never try to get in the way of the stuff that's that I'm writing. Just write it, get it on paper, get it, make it nice later. Um, and then sometimes, not all that often, not as often as it used to be, quite honestly, I realize that I I went down the wrong rabbit hole, and that's probably not the idea that should be ex explored. As far as I don't show my stuff to anybody until I think it's as good as I can get it. I mean, I show it to my wife. I don't show anybody. And then, um, and then Joy, my wife, will be the first reader, <laughs> and and she will tell me where I should perhaps make some changes. So, there was an author, Lauren Carr, I used to have on all the time years ago. She uh, wrote and maybe still does uh, mysteries, and she told me in regards to how she teaches writing classes. Uh, for instance, your characters should never have the same or similar names because it's too confusing to the reader. Do you ascribe to that as well? I do. Not so much. You can't, it's, I think it's a mistake to have, you know, two J names in the same scene because people, uh, the way people read is they just kind of cruise over the, it's called dialogue tags. You know, John said, Joe said, um, but as I think what's more critical than that is to have names that are pronounceable. You know, so um, it's one of the reasons, quite honestly, <laughs> absolute truth, one of the reasons I don't do um, the Arab terrorist bad guys, which so many of my colleagues do, is that the names are really hard to write and to pronounce. And as soon as a reader stumbles, you, know, you kind of get into that fictive dream thing that's happening. And as mm -hmm. soon as you get a word that doesn't work for them, they get ejected out of the story, and I don't want to do that. I want to keep things rolling along. So, yeah, using using um, alliterative names or, or alliterative phrases is, is a mistake. It just kind of breaks the flow of the words, I think. John, what's the greatest challenge someone that wishes to get into suspense writing or any, any writing? Is it the, uh, coming up with a theme or a narrative that would keep someone's attention, or is it the dialogue? Well, I think it's different for everybody. Um, dialogue, I find to be among the easiest parts. Uh, and a lot of writers, I think, that's exactly the opposite. Uh, the idea is to, the way it works for me is I get a kernel of an idea. And wouldn't it be cool if? And, and I kind of develop it from there. I don't, I don't outline. The, the book happens as I write it. I'm as surprised as anybody else as as the story unfolds. Yesterday, for example, we were in this Terlingua, this ghost town, and there was a guy, I don't know, somewhere between 50 and 80, um, obviously spent a lot of time in the sun, was a resident there, had a very difficult time moving around, uh, very long beard, just, you know, he, was, he was a photograph waiting to be taken, but I don't do that, I think that's rude. But in watching him and move around and watching the way he was interacting with people and conversations I couldn't hear, I realized that's my bad guy. You know, just physically, that's my bad guy because it's so not the cliche. Mm -hmm. And um, and that to me, that's very exciting because now I have have a new plot point. And but as far as what the and, and Mike Height gets brothers, to name him too. I was going to say, or I was thinking when you were saying, John, um, that they have to have easily pronounceable names. That Mike Height is a pretty darn easy name to pronounce or to read, yes. right? Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> Thankfully, yeah, exactly, exactly. So along the lines of what Bill was asking, your greatest challenges. Clearly, when um, people come to your workshops. So first off, do you have people who've come multiple times um, or is it usually one and done? And secondly, can you tell um, in a four hour session, like this person really should not even be doing this or wow, this person has a, a 
you know, a little snippet of talent here. And, and maybe that's too much to ask in four hours. Well, first of all, I would never say the first one. I would never tell anybody that, that <laughs> they shouldn't pursue this. Okay. So, you know, writing, writing is, a, is a craft as much as it is a talent. So like any craft, it has to be practiced before you can move on. But, yes, yeah, certainly in a, in a short period of time, um, you can tell where there's, there's a real spark and a real ability. In fact, I start each of these classes with a list. I ask each student to tell me, you know, anybody who comes to this, they came for a reason. There's one thing that they wanted to get out of this course. And I ask them what that one thing is and I make a list. And by the end of the class, I make sure that that one thing has been addressed. So it's not a, it's a fluid class. I mean, there are obviously objectives that I want to achieve, but in between, I want to make sure that everybody gets that, their particular itch scratched the, as, as best as I can. And I think most people know what their weaknesses are or what scares them about the process. John, how much overlap is there between a novelist and a storyteller? Of course, by storyteller, I'm talking about an oral storyteller as opposed to a, a, a novelist. You know, that's a really interesting question. I've never been asked that before. Um, I think the, the oral tradition storytellers are equal parts storyteller and performer. And the performance element is not necessary in writing things on, onto paper. I can, take, I can have 30 different drafts before anybody sees it. Uh, for an oral storyteller, it's not, they, they don't have that luxury. So I think there's a, there's a storytelling quirk or storytelling gene that is common, but that's a different skill set that, um, that I don't have. I can't do the oral storytelling um, I can I can give presentations, I can give speeches, but in terms of characterizing voices and and dragging you know pulling people into a story by speaking, I don't I don't have that skill. Have you ever, um, John, or any of your books um, converted to audiobooks? And if so, do you read them um, for your audiences that way? Um, yes. Well, first of all, all of them are available on audio. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually auditioned to do the audio book, and they wouldn't let me. They said my voice isn't good enough. So um, that was uh, broke my heart. But the audio book actually invades my consciousness while I'm actually writing the book because we went back to alliterative names. That's a real problem in audio, right, because the people who are – reading the book by listening are are getting the story filtered through a third party so you want to make i i find that i'm very conscious of how many he said she said are in there because that interrupts the the audio flow of of the book uh, and then i do have the right just been doing this long enough that i have right of approval for who narrates the books and uh, for the Jonathan Grave books, Basil Sands does an outstanding job, and he's done pretty much all of them. Basil Sands? B-A-S-I-L, Sands. That is a great name. <laughs> that is a great name. Basil Sands. He's, that's an NPR name of some sort. Yeah. Hey, John, you, you made a very interesting— Bill, I'm going to call you Basil Stubblefield from now on. <laughs> I like that first name so much. <laughs> yeah, you, you do, yeah. So it's, it's catchy. It hey, is. Uh, John, you, you made an interesting point about uh, uh, writing books looking down the line for an audio book in addition to just someone reading the book, and you use the phrase, he said, she said. I assume there's a lot of subtleties such as that that you unconsciously or consciously keep in mind. How do you pick these up? Is it done with your discussion with your colleagues? Obviously, the more you write, the more you, uh, uh, you're you conscious of it. Or is have you had instructions, courses that pick up the, that emphasize these subtleties as either an advantage or disadvantage to use? Bill, I took, I took the hard route on all of this. I'm completely self-taught. I took one writing class and it was a disaster when I was in college. Um, no, it's just you kind of learn it along the way and uh, i go and occasionally will look at the the earlier books um and I, I would have written like the first book was a huge hit was nathan's run when it came out if i were to write that book today i would write it entirely differently um it works the way it, it does but 
I have changed. My storytelling and narrative sensibilities have evolved over time, and I, I find that there's cringeworthy elements in there that I don't think readers necessarily find, but uh, because my I've refined my eye, I guess, or my or my voice, if that's not pretentious, that um, it just it it just happens. It evolves. You do something. It's like any other profession, you know. I mean, if if you you try things that don't work as well as others and um and learn learn from your mistakes and learn from your your successes too i mean there's some things that that work very well but in terms of dialogue for example and we'll, we'll talk about this in the class he said said she said can be eliminated a lot if if you just put the action if you put the dialogue attended to action you know give jonathan us an example picked, um jonathan picked up the pen what do you want me to write Right. So you got, he picked up the pen and then quotations. What do you want me to write? I don't need the he said mm -hmm. because it's it's alighted to the to the action itself. Eric O'Rourke has a question for you. He says, do writers have vivid dreams or does that give them ideas? That's an interesting question. It is an interesting question. And I will tell you or my wife will tell you, um, I am I plagued by nightmares. I'm, I have I have screamer dreams um, and I don't know if that's if that's why I write or if, or if that's, you know, uh, a curse of what I do for a living, but I do have vivid dreams and I very rarely remember what they are. I just know that it's, I'm often in peril or more often than not, my, uh, my family will be in peril. I often get on, you know, as a firefighter for a long time, I often arrive on a fire ground in my dreams and I don't have gloves or my air tank is empty or, you know, that, those kinds. It's an that's that's it's a, terrifying. It's an yes. anxiety dream. Yeah. yeah. But but the, uh, you need to build a bridge for me. You said you have these vivid nightmares, but you do not remember them in the morning. Uh, then how right. do you how can you translate those to books? I don't know that they do. I think what I think probably goes the other way around. That I write thrillers, and the tension that you infuse into the stories. I, I, I'm not a psychologist, but I, I, my guess is I imagine that they kind of continue to reside in me. And uh, in order to pull it off on the page, you sort of got to feel it in your heart while you're writing it. I often think of writing as method acting for the page, although I've never taken a method acting course. I've, I've read about it. John, again, if you could plug the writing workshop and give us all the specifics again. Okay. I will be teaching... Adrenaline, adrenaline Rush, uh, How to Write Suspense Fiction at Shepherdstown Public Library from 1 to 4 p.m. on July 8th. Uh, in order to register, please contact Leanne, L-E-E-A-N-N, -E -E -N -N, at, Shep at sheplibrary.org or call 901-229-1065. And to remind everybody, Dylan, if you could bring up the heat warning, John is calling from Texas, where he forwarded this to us uh, yesterday. And these are the conditions where he is in West Texas right now. That heat warning sign that popped up on your screen there. Uh, just uh, nasty there. And, John, with those heat, a glass of water works better than a martini. Actually, no, Bill. And if you if you just as long as you balance it properly, they they both work. <laughs> John, have a great day. Stay cool. All right, I'll do my best. Okay. Thanks for talking to me, John Gilstrap.